hedonistic imperative uh, is essentially the idea that humans are going to master their own genetic source code uh, and rewrite uh, our genetic makeup so that life can be based entirely on gradient on information sensitive gradients of bliss uh, but not merely is it going to be possible for us to re-engineer ourselves it will also be possible for us to re-engineer the rest of the living world uh, nature at present is essentially red in tooth and claw a lot of nature consists of uh, immense cruelty creatures eating each other but in future it would be possible to enjoy yeah, essentially paradise engineering life animated entirely by gradients of intelligent bliss uh, one needs to be quite careful here in that clearly there is a distinction between what is technically possible and what's actually going to happen uh, and it's worth stressing again that we're talking here about phasing out involuntary suffering it's not as though there are any plausible scenarios uh, involving coercive happiness um, uh, sometimes one does hear it referred to as the hedonistic treadmill which actually, which actually would sound quite fun and the technical name is hedonic treadmill uh, and though for some people the hedonic treadmill may be quite enjoyable because their normal average set point of well-being is quite high for other people it might better be called the dolorous treadmill um, just to, uh, to, to summarise, um, over the course of a lifetime clearly uh, environmental contingencies have significant impact into whether we feel our lives are going well or badly but nonetheless over the course of uh, weeks, days and months on the whole most of us tend to fluctuate around an approximate set point. Uh, some people their hedonic set point is, is, is quite high, we would describe them as temperamentally happy optimistic people, other people it's uh, set quite low. Um, some people are pretty equable, others are much more vo volatile, but nonetheless over the course of a lifetime uh, people will tend to fluctuate around this mean and we know from for example twin studies that this approximate hedonic set point has a quite high degree of genetic loading uh, in the sense that if you have an identical twin and that you were reared apart let's say your identical twin lived uh, in America or Australia or whatnot the chances are that right now uh, your twin would probably be roughly the same level of, of average well-being or ill-being I mean, of course, that could be different, it's like somewhat different circumstances if he or she were going through an unhappy divorce or something like that. Uh, but nonetheless, it is unusual if you have genetically identical twins to have one who is temperamentally happy and one who is temperamentally miserable. Um, and already we are starting to untangle the genetic basis of uh, of of hedonic tone and uh, hedonic set points. There are certain, for, here, here, just, just one example, uh, the COMPS gene, catecholomethyltransferase, has two main variants, two main alleles. One is associated with a high hedonic set point, another with a lower uh, set point. And other things being equal, uh, it is clearly going to be desirable if you are temperamentally happy and more to the point already if we wanted to today we could use pre-implantation genetic diagnosis to choose which variant of the COMPS gene we gave we give to our future offspring and that's just one gene amongst many. There are uh, other genes and of course it's not purely hedonic tone, it's going to be possible to uh, select for such uh, traits as whether someone is uh, temperamentally uh, empathetic, uh, uh, agreeable, jealous, personality variables like this. Um, and over the long run, if there is what one might call this reproductive revolution of designer babies, where instead of of, of just trusting God or Mother Nature if instead prospective parents do use pre-implantation genetic diagnosis and eventually design their genomes to choose personality variables, hedonic set point, upper and lower bounds of hedonic range then over the long run there is likely to be significant selection pressure in favour of a much higher subjective quality of life 
for our future children and grandchildren and beyond. So this is not when, one t when I talk about a future based on gradients of intelligent bliss, this isn't purely utopian dreaming. There are at least tentative grounds for thinking that this will come to pass. I mean, one can't, of course, be certain. For example, uh, there could be, uh, let's say, a growth of religious fundamentalism and a taboo on use of the new reproductive technologies. But other things being equal, just ask yourself, if, if you could actually choose the average hedonic set point and the upper and lower bounds of your child's hedonic range, what would you choose? I mean, perhaps you won't necessarily go for the absolute maximum but other things being equal you'll want to have a have a happy child not least uh, happy children will tend to be other things being equal more successful it, it, it's a winning strategy I mean one needn't believe uh, prospective uh, parents who say that all they care about is their children's happiness many parents clearly care about a lot of other things many parents are intensely ambitious for their children but very very few prospective parents if any are what going to want to have depressive angst-ridden children that's not a recipe for success I think quite often people will uh, confuse being blissful with being blissed out now if we were uniformly happy this seems to be inconsistent with critical insight, social responsibility, uh, uh, stuff, stuff like that. But if we aim for hedonic recalibration, it's going to be possible to, for you to retain and pass on to your children what you regard as valuable, your core values, existing preference architecture, and yet at the same time quality of life can be much higher. So the hedonistic imperative, it's not a plea uh, for getting blissed out. It's, it's a plea for radical hedonic recalibration. Now, other common objections. I think a lot of people feel that in, in some sense it's necessary to have the nasty side of life to appreciate the good stuff. And some people would actually argue it's, it's incoherent, the idea of life that is intrinsically wonderful, life, lifelong well-being. Um, however, perhaps it's worth focusing on people today who tragically suffer from chronic depression and or pain disorders. Uh, now, it would be cruel in the extreme to tell someone who is chronically depressed that they, they can't really be depressed because they can't contrast it with happiness. And sadly, there are people, not merely who are never happy, in, in the case of some severe chronic depressives, they can't even imagine uh, what the word happiness means. Uh, and at the other end of the scale, they're much more uh, ready. One really, one does have a handful of so-called hypothymic people who really do spend their lives animated by, by, by gradients of well-being. Um, now, even if one is hypothymic, even if one's hedonic set point is un unusually high, it's still possible to have uh, a bad hair day, so to speak, even in, in, in paradise. But nonetheless, if one is lucky enough to have an extremely high uh, hedonic set point and one's hedonic floor is much higher than some people's hedonic ceiling, then one's quality of life, other things being equal, will be much higher. And it's still possible to pursue your uh, uh, career, your intellectual interests, your family, social responsibilities. It's, it doesn't involve uh, uh, giving up uh, your core values, unless that is, your core values are in some sense tied to the infliction of, of involuntary suffering. Um, other misconceptions. Um, I think perhaps it's worth tackling the issue of of physical pain. I've been talking rather quite a lot about uh, psychological well-being but what about raw physical pain? Surely uh, physical pain is absolutely indispensable uh, to high functioning life. In the rare cases today of people born with congenital analgesia they have to have incredibly cosseted cotton wool existences because they're prone to damaging each other. Um, I think there's a a short-term and a long-term solution here. Uh, the short-term solution is when we are having children uh, uh, choosing a very uh, high pain threshold, not complete congenital analgesia, but 
there are a number of, of genes and genetic variants involved in pain thresholds and let's take the SCN9A gene. Uh, complete nonsense mutations induce congenital analgesia. Other mutations induce an extremely high or low pain threshold, either within the normal range. And that by choosing extremely an extremely high pain threshold for your future child, you can preserve the function of nociception so that your child can continue to, uh, let's say, respond uh, to uh, aversive, physically noxious stimuli, and yet at the same time, pain doesn't ever blight his or her life. Um, so, yeah, that's a short term solution. In the long run, it, if, if we really want to abolish any form of, of, of aversive experience, physically aversive experience, it should be possible to offload the function of nociception onto our smart prostheses. For example, if one has a smart prosthesis, what, a prosthesis one's hand could um, just before one is about to uh, stick it on the hot stove, withdraw one's hand to prevent one damaging one's fingers. Uh, presumably with such a smart prosthesis one would want to fit it with a manual override so one doesn't feel one has lost control of one's body. Um, the other, I suppose, alternative to smart prostheses would be to, uh, uh, to re-engineer ourselves so that life was animated in t uh, uh, bodily life was animated entirely by gradients of physical well-being. Um, possibly that sounds incoherent, but one, th one simply needs to think, for example, of two, two sensitive people making love. Uh, the process may be generically agreeable throughout, yet nonetheless sensitive lovers do respond to feedback. Um, well, I needn't go down that perhaps fanciful route. Uh, smart, uh, sm as I said, smart prostheses can take care of nociception. In the meantime, I, I think our focus should be when having children to make sure that our children's lives aren't blighted by, uh, yes, uh, uh, pain sensitivity or a low hedonic set point. Um, I think it's worth bearing in mind that at present every single child born is a unique genetic experiment. So it's not a case of the safe option, it's a leap into the unknown having children. Um, now if life today were wonderfully good, then tweaking it and experimenting with it, I would say there would be a, a strong case for extreme caution in the same way uh, that before a new drug is introduced for a trivial condition, one wants to make absolutely sure it's safe. But as we know, unfortunately, life today for countless people, countless organisms on the planet, is actually extremely grim. Um, around one million people every year take their own lives, uh, perhaps 20 times that number uh, uh, either attempt to commit suicide or commit acts of serious self-harm. There are hundreds of millions of people who are clinically or subclinically depressed. Others suffer from anxiety disorders, uh, jealousy, social phobia, all manner of psychological problems. Um, and even people who buy today's standards are relatively healthy. Nonetheless, for evolutionary reasons, a lot of their lives are spent discontented because uh, Mother Nature is not interested in, so to speak, the well-being of individual or organisms. Essentially, natural selection is about what is the most effective way to pass on our genes. And on the African savanna, other things being equal, it was fitness enhancing, it was adaptive for mothers to be extraordinarily neurotic, endlessly worrying about lions and threats to their offspring. It was fitness enhancing for men to be constantly seeking, uh, being discontented, looking for new opportunities, new, new, new uh, attempts to have sex, to become uh, richer, to compete. Essentially, this whole panoply of nasty uh, adaptations that are fitness enhancing, yes, good for our genes, but not good for individual organisms. Um, take, for example, depression. Uh, now, though it might seem obvious that depression is maladaptive, from a gene's eye perspective, this doesn't seem to be often the case. Why does low mood exist at all? 
Uh, it seems, to the best of our knowledge, evolutionary psychologists would say, to be an adaptation to group living. That on the African savanna it was advantageous for vulnerable apes to live in, in, uh, in tribes rather than be isolated, which could be lethal. Uh, and yet, if you are a rather weedy or puny, not, a, not an alpha male, if you were prone constantly to be challenging the dominant alpha, you would be liable to get severely mauled, damaged, perhaps cast out of the tribe. And though natural selection doesn't care per se about the raw textures of experience, nonetheless, the actual spectrum of behaviour associated with low mood i.e. subordinate uh, behaviour, behavioural suppression, not challenging the dominant alpha, uh, uh, alphas, uh, is actually fitness, in, fitness enhancing. Being a, uh, uh, or acting as a dominant al alpha uh, is a high risk, high reward strategy. Um, so, uh, yes, it's not as though uh, 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 depression is good uh, for, the mo for, for the well-being of the individual, but it helped our ancestors to pass on more copies of their genes, this conditionally activated uh, 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 predisposition. Um, that actually ties into a criticism that is sometimes made of hedonistic comparative and similar scenarios, that if we were happy uh, all the time, or as, as, as a better formulation, if we enjoyed uh, information sensitive gradients of bliss, wouldn't we be more uh, vulnerable to manipulation and control by the ruling elites? I mean, this is the brave new world scenario. But actually, other things being equal, it's, it's low mood that induces subordinate behaviour, cowed subordinate behaviour and submission, and that other things being equal, by recalibrating the hedonic treadmill, by promoting good mood, optimism, one is making it more likely one is having active citizens who won't just uh, kowtow. Um, of course, not having a society based on, uh, to a large extent, submissive, timid people, you know, sort of depression, this internalised corollary to the losing subroutine, this potentially uh, has problems of its own but uh, yes uh, so uh, uh, in a nutshell then uh, it's simplistic to say that if one has a happy citizenry this makes us all easier to control.